Good morning. It's good to have a response when you say good morning. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Um, great to have you with us this morning. It's a beautiful morning. Um, beautiful day yesterday as well, and it's lovely to have you in church with us this morning. It's also lovely to have you with us if you're joining us online this morning. Um, it's, um, I hope you'll um, enjoy our service and be blessed by it this morning. I'm just going to run through a few announcements now and um, get those out of the road. Um, so this morning, David will be continuing on our, on our series of sermons about the life of David. And this morning, it'll be from 1 Samuel 26. The Lord's table will follow immediately after the service, um, but it will not be live streamed. But after, after the service, if, if, you're, if you're a visitor with us this morning and you're not prepared for the table, don't worry about it. Or if you haven't brought the elements with you, don't worry about that. Um, please stay with us and, and remember the Lord, um, as is our habit of doing on a Sunday morning. There's no prayer meeting this week. Um, it'll be recommencing in August, um, and the format of that is still to be decided. So if, if you have any opinion on how we should be doing midweek prayer, please don't be afraid to let one of the leadership team know. Um, there'll be a chance after the service this morning to have a socially distanced cup of tea in our well-ventilated car park. Um, so um, we've got a beautiful day for it. So, so please um, hang around and have a bit of fellowship afterwards over a cup of tea or a cup of, of coffee. Um, and if over the summer when things are a little bit slower and there's not as much going on in the church, um, if you need any um, pastoral support at all, um, please contact one of the leadership team. Um, think about um, giving David a, an, an email at davidw at ballinahengebaptist.org or speak to, to, to any one of the leadership team who will, who will pass it on to, to David. Um, Please also be aware that the care offering is, is still available for those people um, connected to our fellowship who may be in trouble at the moment um, in, a, in a financial way or maybe just need a little bit of extra help. If you know of anybody in, in those circumstances, um, please don't be afraid to, to contact us and let us know and we will try in a confidential way to help people out um, in, in, who find themselves um, in those circumstances. The Churches Together helpline is also still running um, and you can ring it to, to ask for prayer. Um, to receive financial advice, just to speak to someone or to um, access the food bank. Um, if you know of anyone who needs to avail of that, um, I always have to read this number out because I'm terrible with numbers. The number is 0333-050-1167. That's 033-050-167. And speaking of the food bank, um, you can still leave donations in on a Tuesday at First Presbyterian Church. Um, the work done there is vital at this time of the year. And there was a, a report that came out there just to, to let everybody know what was happening up until the end of June. And from April to June this year, the Food Bank in Ballinahenge has distributed food parcels for almost 6,000 meals. It's a vital job. And if you, if you want to drop off either a donation or some food um, that would be helpful, um, you can drop that off on Tuesday mornings at First Presbyterian. Let's just read from God's Word. I'd like to read from First Chronicles chapter 16, starting at verse 23. Now, this is obviously a part of David's life that we're going to be covering further on. Um, but these are, to put it in context, these, this is whenever David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And the praise was set out um, for, the, for the priests to sing to the Lord. So starting from verse 23 at First Chronicles chapter 16. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Let the sea resound in all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Let the trees of the forest sing. Let them sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Cry out 
Save us, God our Savior. Gather us and deliver us from the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Let's just come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are majestic, ruling, and above all, we thank you that as we come before you this morning, that you're in control of everything. As we come before you this morning with the week that's just passed, we would ask that you would help us to take this time to concentrate on you, that you would take this time to speak to us and that you would speak through David as he comes later on. Help us as we worship you. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we come before you to bring you glory, honor, and praise. And that the worship that we bring this morning would be acceptable to you. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Siobhan and Jane are just going to come and lead us in some songs. Now. I'll fix this for you. been thinking a lot over this last week about the goodness of God and about how even when things are difficult, where the plans aren't going the way we expected, where there's ill health or accident or where we're struggling emotionally or spiritually or we're struggling with pain, about how God's goodness is still there. God's goodness and faithfulness is above all of that and that we can rely on that goodness and faithfulness um, in all of the times of our lives, the, the nice stuff and the not so nice stuff. Um, and I've been drawn very much to Psalm 40 over the last few days. Um, and verse 5 of Psalm 40 says, Lord my God, you have done many things. Your wondrous works and your plans for us, none can compare with you. If I were to report and speak of them, they are more than can be told. And in fact, the message says, I would not have enough words. We do not have the words. We do not have the vocabulary to, to really recount back to God how amazing he is. But let's lift our voices in praise as we sing. To the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever.
And those of you who know me well may or may not know that I am a bit of a U2 fan. And uh, one of my first introductions to U2 was actually the song 40. Um, now, I just love this song. And it is taken from Psalm 40. They have modernized the words and put it to a, a pop tune but I absolutely love it. And when I was searching for it um, on YouTube, actually yesterday morning, um, I came across fabulous versions of it, including one from a concert in in Chicago where they also sing their song, Yahweh. And they sing the two side by side as the close. And they did that for the whole of that American tour so that the people who left that concert were singing the song. They're singing the words of Psalm 40 as they left the concert. I love that. I think that's so powerful. But when I was looking um, looking for those videos, I found a video I didn't expect. And if you have time this afternoon, go on to YouTube and watch a brilliant video where um, Bono talks with Eugene Peterson, the, the author of the message um, version of the Bible. And they talk about um, their love of the Psalms and how the Psalms have spoken to them all throughout their lives uh, and throughout their Christian journey. I'm going to read you Psalm 40 um, taken from the message. I'm not going to read it all, but I'm going to read a few chunks. I waited and waited and waited for God. At last he looked. Finally he listened. He lifted me out of the ditch. He pulled me from deep mud. He stood me up on solid rock to make sure I wouldn't slip. He taught me how to sing the latest God song, a praise song to our God. More and more people are seeing this. They enter the mystery, abandoning themselves to God. Blessed are you who give yourselves over to God. Turn your back on the world's sure thing. Ignore what the world worships. The world's a huge stockpile of God wonders and God thoughts. Nothing and no one compares to you. I start talking about you, telling what I know, and quickly run out of words. Neither numbers nor words account for you. Doing something for you, bringing something to you, that's not what you're after. Being religious, acting pious, that's not what you're asking for. You've opened my ears so I can listen. So I answered, I'm coming. I read in your letter what you wrote about me, and I'm coming to the party you're throwing for me. That's when God's word entered my life, became part of my very being. But all who are hunting for you, oh, let them sing and be happy. Let those who know what you're all about tell the world you're great and not quitting. And me, I'm a mess. I'm nothing and have nothing. Make something of me. You can do it. You've got what it takes. But God, don't put it off. Let's sing our praises to God.
Father, we are nothing without you. And that is not something that is a curse, but a blessing. We know, Lord, that our strength is limited and we are weak. But Lord, you are strong and faithful and good. And we can trust you. Lord, may our worship continue in a way this morning that pleases you and brings you joy. Lord, may we glorify your name in everything we do and say this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Slightly over a year ago, the world was thrown into a global pandemic of the COVID-19 virus. The speed and depth with which this virus spread and affected nations around the world was breathtaking. Quite simply, this was something the world was not prepared for. Many countries experienced economic shock, which in turn led to a tsunami of people around the world without jobs, without livelihoods, without trend, and without the most basic of human necessities, food. Consequently, in the past year, Compassion was faced with significant challenges in all 25 of our program countries. In 2020, we made a promise that would use your sponsorship funds to address these critical needs. Since April of last year, Compassion has provided over 12 million family food packs and over 8 million hygiene kits. And because we could not always use our normal food distribution methods, we quickly adapted and began giving direct cash transfers in some of our field countries. We focused on educating families and communities on how to take practical steps to safeguard themselves. At the same time, we ensured that we increased our child protection awareness and interventions as appropriate to each case. Of course, COVID-19 was not the only challenge 2020 brought. The consequences of the pandemic were also compounded by natural disasters, as well as social and political crises across the world. For example, in the Africa region, 2020 brought plagues of locust unlike anything that had been experienced in over 70 years. In Asia, we experienced destructive typhoons. In Latin America and Caribbean, we witnessed an unusually high number of storms and hurricanes in 2020. Some of our field countries were severely affected and again, Compassion stepped in to support children and families. As we enter midway 2021, we can be thankful that vaccines are beginning to counter the spread of COVID-19 and they're becoming available. Nonetheless, vaccines are not yet universally available around the world. Consequently, we're still needing to address the challenge of COVID-19. We are still providing support for food and hygiene kits to the most vulnerable families and children in our programs. We are stepping up efforts to innovate on how we deliver education content to youth and children where schools are still on lockdown. This spirit of program innovation and agility is something that we will continue to carry forward in the years to come. As I look over the past one year, and even this year, I can see clear signs of God's faithfulness over this ministry. He has given us everything that we have needed. We know that the needs of our neighbors have increased tremendously in this season. But I'm encouraged that the God who has been faithful to us in our most difficult days will also be faithful to us in the days to come. We can trust Him. I encourage all of us to rededicate ourselves and our calling and our work so that we can reach more neighbors with the love of God, the love that God has given to us and through us. On behalf of the 8,000 churches in the 25 countries, on behalf of the families of the over 2 million children and youth that we support, thank you for your prayers and thank you for your giving. Children, I would like to say thank you. Um, about 12 children are sponsored by us here at Ballinahinch Baptist. And I, I want to say a sincere thank you for uh, all our sponsors and uh, all you're doing. Uh, your money in the last year has been used to provide uh, food. Um, we reckon over 250 million uh, meals have been provided internationally through our 8,000 church partners in 25 developing countries. So uh, your money is still being used to the glory of God. Uh, hygiene kits have been provided and um, 
uh, cash has even been given. We don't normally give cash, uh, but in the extreme circumstances of the uh, pandemic, we have actually uh, given cash to people uh, to help them buy food. Many of the governments have stopped um, the churches having a food distribution center because there were riots at the food distribution at churches. So they uh, have, have given money instead. But thank you for what you're doing. It's making a huge difference internationally. Uh, and thank you for how you've responded uh, to, to the children. Um, just to give you an idea, the best of the poorest countries that we work in um, have achieved a vaccination rate of 2%, but more than half of the 25 countries have only achieved a vaccination rate of 1%. Now, we are sitting at um, 64, 65% of our population has received two jabs, and that's, that's a lot more than the, the developing world. So do pray for our uh, partners, for our sponsored children, and I pray that the vaccine will roll out in the developing world as well. Obviously, um, the priority is, is uh, UK and uh, the West, but also there's a, a great need in the developing world. I brought a few children with me this morning, just in case anyone's not a sponsor and you'd like to become a sponsor, or perhaps if you sponsor one and you'd like to sponsor another, uh, uh, if this is something the Lord lays on your heart, please pick up an envelope as you leave and uh, fill in the form and send it back in the prepaid envelope provided. Um, if you're at home and you're watching and you'd like to sponsor a child through Compassion, uh, email me, davidw at ballonahinchbaptist.org, and I'll make sure that I, I drop off or post to you uh, one of these children. Uh, let's just uh, pray. Father, we thank you for the work and ministry of the Compassion Frontline Partner Churches. We thank you for what they're doing in the developing world, and we pray that you'll be with those especially who are not able to meet in person like us. We ask, Lord, that you'll help them in their small groups and in their one-to-one -one visits, and pray that uh, they will have wisdom in how they best help those children in need. We also pray for our government and uh, the rollout of the vaccine among the poor. Uh, we pray particularly for Brazil and Peru, for El Salvador and Haiti, uh, where the numbers are probably worst of all. Father, we pray that vaccines will be received from the wealthier countries and that people will develop uh, a, an immunity uh, to COVID-19. Father, we thank you for the blessings of our country. We thank you for the wonder of, of science that has helped us get to this point. And we pause to pray for those who are ill, those who are in hospital, and pray, Lord, that you will heal them if that is your will. We thank you for our doctors and nurses, for the pharmacists, and for others on the team who make it possible for people to receive treatment which is, is free at the point of delivery. This is such a blessing and the envy of every other country in the world. And Father, we pray that you'll help us to appreciate that and to give you thanks for the provision that is ours. We realize we are so blessed, and yet we do not forget those who are in need. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. For what David has been talking to us about, take some time to pray as well for um, the town of Balnehinch and, and our country. Let's just take, take a moment or two. 
Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and anew we, we confess our need of you. We're not able in our own strength, uh, in our own knowledge, in our own wisdom to help ourselves. And we ask you to forgive us for, for so often just going on ahead in our own way, in our own time, and trying to do things w- without you. As a church, we need you. As a town, we need you. And as a country, we need you. And as David's been sharing with us, as a world, we need you. We pray for, for those in our country in authority over us, at Stormont and at Westminster. And for those in the south, we pray for those in Dublin and the Doyle. We pray they have a... We would ask you that you would help them with, with the heavy responsibility that they have as leaders. And we would ask that you would speak to them, convict them of their need of you, and give them wisdom in the decisions that they make. We thank you for, for a peaceful July in our own country. Um, and we pray that men and women intent on doing evil deeds here would be thwarted. And that you would be glorified in this country instead. And we've been thinking this morning of the work of compassion and we ask that you would help those who show your love to children and families around the world and share the good news with, with, of Jesus with those children and parents. We ask that you would help them, especially at this time of global pandemic, of natural disasters, of conflict and war. Thank you for those who are working in your name to bring love, to bring relief, to bring physical help to those in need at this time. And we pray especially for their work as they would spread the gospel, that men and women and young children would come to a knowledge of you, that you would save them. Give the directors of Compassion Wisdom as to how to organize their efforts best to reach more people with the word of God. And we also want to pray for those from our own fellowship who are serving you in other places. Um, We'd ask Heavenly Father that you would keep them safe, that you would protect them from the pandemic, and that you would bless their work wherever they are. Pray for Nico and Rachel, James and Elaine, Simon and Hannah, David and Cheryl and their families, and ask that you would keep them safe and bless their work. We pray for Mike and Lenore as well. We ask that you would keep Mike safe in the work that he does too. We'd ask you to be close to the churches in Ukraine, Heavenly Father, and guide them and help the pastors there as they shepherd the believers. Keep them safe from the virus and give them wisdom and strength to work for you where you have placed them. We thank you that you're a loving Father and you care for us. You care for us in our weaknesses, in our sickness, and in our stresses. We ask for those in our fellowship who are struggling with illness, depression, or bereavement that you would bring comfort, relief, and assurance of your presence and of an, your assurance of your presence and your love for them. Help those families caring for the sick and elderly and give them strength for the daily tasks that they undertake. We know that you love us with an everlasting love and we know that we need to trust you to direct us. Help us to live for you and show us and show your love to those that we meet. We pray for the people of Balnehinch meeting in various places around the town this morning. We pray for wherever your word is preached this morning that it would bear fruit and that this town and surrounding district would be transformed by you into a place where where men and women are saved. Bless the work of Stan and the team at the Edge as well as they serve the young people of the town and and help them as they they share your love with with young people who who need you. So as we continue in your presence this morning, Father, we would ask that you would bless David as he would come and speak to us. We would ask that you would give him the words to say, that you would speak and that you would help him. Speak to us, Heavenly Father. We had asked that you would be glorified in everything that goes on in this place. Be with us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I hope you're not too hot. Um, Perhaps we could stand while I read from the scriptures. it's a, a practice others have, have uh, introduced, and I think it's a good practice. It certainly changes our position and uh, helps stretch our backs. So, um, and hopefully it'll stop you falling asleep in this heat when I'm talking. Okay. So, I'm reading from 1 Samuel 26. So, the Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill of Hakla? 
which faces Jessam. So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakala, facing Jess Shimon, uh, but David stayed in the desert. And when he saw that Saul had followed there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. When David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped, he saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying, lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. David then asked Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Abishai, son of Zeruiah, Job's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has given your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't, thrust him to, I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he said, the Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. And there was a wide space between them. And he called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, who are you who calls the king? David said, you're the man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord, the king? Someone came to destroy your lord, the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men deserve to die because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? And Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done and what wrong am I guilty of? Now let my lord the king listen to his servant's words. If the lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance, my share in the Lord's inheritance, and have said, go, serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one who hunts a partridge in the mountains." Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life precious today. I will not harm you again. Surely I've acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Here's the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord gave you into my hands today but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so the Lord, may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. Then Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. Amen to God's precious word and you may be seated. You remember a couple of chapters ago, uh, we had a similar situation where uh, Saul was in a cave and uh, David spared his life. And at the end of that, uh, Saul made David enter into a covenant uh, and uh, he said he was sorry and uh, he wouldn't let it happen again. And, and yet he continued to pursue David and he continued to uh, seek to um, 
kill him. He was desperate to kill David and recognized what was happening. David, David didn't trust him. He, he knew he was fickle. He knew he was unpredictable. And again and again, Saul had that urgent desire to kill David. He was totally dishonest. That's why David remained a fugitive, and from time to time, people would in, inform Saul where David was spotted, so there were informers everywhere. No doubt that they thought they would be handsomely rewarded by the king. This time, it was the Ziphites. That's not unusual. They've done that before. And David only escaped the last time because the Philistines uh, uh, unexpectedly invaded. And of course, they were the bigger enemy than David. So off uh, Saul went to deal with them as a matter of priority. And as 3,000 men were marching towards David, you get the sense that he was aware that something was going down, something big was happening. So he uh, sent uh, some spies uh, to work out exactly what was happening. David decided that this was the time to prove once and for all that he and Saul were two totally different men. It was a time for the armed forces of Israel and the entire nation to recognize that Saul could not be trusted, whereas David was different. He was a man of his word. If he was to be a successful leader one day, it was vital that the people discover now that he was reliable. That night, he asked for a volunteer to go with him into the uh, camp of Saul. That was a, a brave man that he was seeking, and the Bishai, he said he would go with him in the darkness to defy the king. He was the brother of Job, and he was willing to go. So it was normal for the king to rest and sleep in the middle of his army uh, so that he wasn't exposed. Uh, there would be loads of people outside uh, and uh, loads of people, 3,000 men. Uh, so at any point, I suppose there were a few hundred before anyone would get to harm the king. And he thought he was safe. So David, remember the shepherd boy who'd killed a bear and a lion, with a bish eye, silently and skillfully crept into the middle of the camp. 3,000 sleeping soldiers, and David and the Bishai, in the darkness, make it right up to Saul. That's ama amazing, really. I don't know about you. I'm not very good in the dark. Um, and when there's total darkness and there's no street lights, uh, it takes your eyes a long time to adjust. And it's actually difficult to find your way. Can you imagine tiptoeing, creeping through 3,000 soldiers, well, a fraction of that, but hundreds of soldiers to get to the place where Saul the king was. And they came there, and he was sleeping with a spear and water jug. You couldn't survive without water in the desert. You know that. And he had a container uh, next to him. And the sight must have sent a shiver down the spine of Abishai. In verse 8, he says, look, today, David, and I'm sure they were whispering, today God has given your enemy into your hand. Now let me, with one strike, pin him to the ground. Let me sort this whole matter out once and for all, so silently and quietly no one will stir. Just let me do it with one action. I won't need to do a second one. But David said to Abishai, don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And Abishai stood back. The Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and the water jug that are there near his head and let's go. And they crept out of the camp. No one stirred. They'd got in, grabbed the spear, grabbed, grabbed the water jug, and they got out again. 
And verse 12 finishes with the words, the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. So the Lord was in this, and the Lord was helping David. And he and Abishai made a clean getaway. David had allowed his emotions and physical reflexes to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. By God's power, David was restrained again from harming the king. He saw him instead as the Lord's anointed. Indeed, David had warned Abishai, as surely as the Lord lives, the Lord himself will strike him, or his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish, verse 10. David knew God was in control. Now, he was a fugitive. He was on the run. He didn't know where his food was coming from. He wasn't very secure, but he knew God, and he was trusting God, and he knew that God would work out his purpose in the end. And that's tough. It's easy for us because we've read the book and we know who wins in the end. But David hadn't the book. David didn't know how this was going to end. Yes, he knew God had anointed him for the role of king. How would it end? How would it turn out? He didn't know. But right here and now in this battle, he recognized that Saul was still the anointed one of God and he wouldn't lay a hand on him. In time, God would honor David for not taking revenge. And once he was safely outside the camp on the crest of a nearby hill, he shouts across the valley to Abner. Abner was the captain of the army. And he says to Abner, what have you done? It's not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men must die because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look, look around you. Where is the king's spear? Where is the king's water jar that were near his head? And as they looked, and as they realized, and it dawned on them that the spear and the water jug were gone, they must have been terrified when they realized that actually David and the man standing next to him, who we knew as Abishai, were that close to the king. And by now the whole camp was awake. 3,000 soldiers were realizing, and it was dawning on them, what had just happened. And Saul, of course, recognized David's voice. Why is my Lord pursuing his servant, David asks. What have I done? What wrong am I guilty of? The king of Israel has come out looking for a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Humbled yet again and shamed, Saul cried out, I've sinned. Come back, David, my son, because you considered my life more precious today. I, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I've acted like a fool. You have been and have been terribly wrong. On the face of it, those words sound very sincere, but they weren't. This was a cry of wounded pride. He was ashamed that he had been exposed. He had rejected the advice of Samuel the prophet. He had rejected God. He had become a castaway, hardened against both God and man. He never recognized the evil of what he was doing and that the sin of his soul was a crime against God. He never recognized the stubbornness of his own will, the disobedience of his spirit, and the selfishness of his motives. His actions were an affront to the love of the Most High God. And despite all that the Lord had done for Saul to deliver him from his self-centered preoccupation, Saul insisted on taking the downward path of his own self-destruction. David couldn't trust him. 
Indeed, God couldn't trust him. David would not place himself within Saul's reach again. And he invited one of Saul's young men to come over to the crest of the hill where he stood to retrieve the spear and the water jug. Verse 22. He urged the king to stop this pursuit, to stop persecuting him, and Saul knew. In verse 24 and 25, that David would surely do great things in triumph. Yet in his muddled mind, he was not at all sure. He wasn't sure what was going on. And as I've reflected on this this week, I, I've wondered what psalm would rightly describe David's feelings at this time. And I've picked 43, and I'm sure there are loads of others. Vindicate me, O Lord. Plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Rescue me from the deceitful and wicked men. You are God, my stronghold. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? Send forth your light and your truth. Let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Then will I go to the altar of God. To God, my joy and my delight, I will praise you with the harp, O God, my God. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. So what does God want us to take out of 1 Samuel 26? What are we to take away this morning? So what, you may say. Paul in the New Testament makes it very clear that one of the fruits of the Spirit in the life of the believer is self-control. Now, you've learned them in Sunday school. You know each of them. And uh, it begins with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. What comes next? Gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And against these nine things, there is no law. Now, self-control may come last, but it is a Christian virtue, and it is a sign that the Lord lives in us. The world knows nothing of self-control. It's a mark of the believer. It's really interesting when you ditch the Bible, and many people are ditching the Bible today, and they think they can ditch God and they can do their own thing. That's not new, let me tell you. If you look at the end of Judges, you'll find that. Um, that's how Judges ends. Judges 21 verse 25 says, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And if ever that could describe the majority of people in Northern Ireland today, it's that verse. Everyone's doing what's right in their own eyes because they've rejected the Bible and they think it's outdated, they think it's irrelevant, and it's not necessary to follow its precepts. But let me tell you this, this book may be an old book, it may be a book that seems outdated in today's modern world, but this book is different to any other book you will read or see, because this is God's Word. This is God speaking to you and me. He is the author, and what He says stands true for all eternity. It will never change. It is absolute truth, and because of my knowledge of God, and my relation with Him through Jesus Christ. This book is valued by me because I believe God knows me through and through. He understands my ways, my motives, my heart, my desires. He understands what's good for me, what's best for me, 
and I trust him with my life, and I know that he will work out his purposes in me. So when God says to us, if you want to follow me, you're going to be known as people who are self-controlled, that's serious. I believe self-control begins in our minds, how we think, and it's about choice. We have a choice how we think and what we think. That choice is ours to make. We can choose to think on good things or on evil things, shady things. What fills your thoughts? I know what Paul says. He says in Philippians 4, brothers and sisters, and he, he says, finally. Do you know, if I'm doing a summary um, in, a, in a report, it can be called an executive summary, okay? And if you can't read a whole report and you just want to get to the nub of it, you'll read the executive summary. And this is the punchline. This is what's really important after a, a degree of, of research or whatever. And this is what Paul says at the end of his letter to the Philippians, finally, above all, I could almost say, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, wow, what adjectives. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. Focus on those things. Fill your mind. We're funny human beings, aren't we? If someone pays us a compliment, we feel good. But if someone says something negative about us, we feel bad. And if you take people, and psychologists have researched this, and they've said that for every negative comment we receive, it takes at least 10 positive comments to make up for that one negative comment. So the negative comment has the power to cripple us, to curtail us, to ruin us, until we've at least had 10 positive things. The hymn writer said something like this, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And I'm quite sure you'll find more than 10. If we're honest with ourselves and we're honest with God, I believe we'll find more than 10. So don't let the negative thing ruin you. Don't let it eat you away. Sit down and think about beautiful things, lovely things, admirable things. Focus on the Lord. And remember, Jesus spoke to Peter. When Peter said, no, you're not going to die. Before that, let's get this verse out. Romans 12, verse 2. It's really important. Honestly, the way we think is so important and what's influencing our thoughts. Paul says in Romans 12, do not conform to the pattern of this world. You know, it's very easy for us to get our beliefs from social media, from secular books, from the press, from television. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, His perfect, pleasing, and per His perfect, uh, good, pleasing, and perfect will. Satan comes, and the negatives are there, and Satan loves to get us down, and he'll say things like, oh, well, a Christian wouldn't do that. Oh, well, you're a hypocrite. Oh, well, you've blown it now. And these things come to our minds, and they're negative, and he's saying them to us because he wants us to give up. Jesus said that. 
And Peter spoke up when Jesus was talking about his death and resurrection. Peter said, not so, Lord. That's not going to happen. Not on my watch. No, Lord. And Jesus responded to him, get behind me, Satan, Matthew 16 and Mark 8. You see, he was saying, look, my thinking's different to the world's thinking. My thinking involves a different way of thinking. And then we'll know what God's will is. There's a needle and a radical need for change in our thinking. Not just the default thinking of others around us in the world who have not yet been saved, but spiritual thinking that's focused on God and His Word, the Bible. This take, takes effort and work. It's more difficult than freewheeling down a hill. Uh, that's my daughter's uh, favorite part of cycling, the freewheeling bit down the hill. I remember we used to struggle uh, um, to get her up the hill uh, when we went for a family ride. Uh, but she loved the downhill bit. That was great. We loved to stroll along the beach. But this is no walk in the park either. This is hard. We are being transformed by the renewing of our minds by the rejection of the thinking of the world. We're training ourselves as people preparing for battle to have a new way of thinking that is scriptural and honoring to God. And there's always the need for the help of the Holy Spirit. We can't do this by ourselves. And it's no mistake that Paul calls this a fruit of the Spirit. Take care of your thoughts when you're alone. and take care of your words when you're with people. I wonder if we spent 10% of the time reading the Bible compared to the amount of time we spent on our phones. What a difference that would make in our lives. When we think about the most important thing. Jesus says the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. And what comes out of our mouth sometimes can show that our hearts are far from God and that our thoughts are influenced more by the world and secular thinking than by the Bible and God's words. James says that the tongue is it's more than a spark that lights a forest fire. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, it sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself on, set on fire by hell. Causes a huge amount of damage. This is also a choice what we say. Before you speak, think. You've seen this before. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? So let's guard our thoughts. Let's read more of the Scripture. Take in more wholesome food for thought as Paul encourages us, and seek the help of the Holy Spirit to be people who exercise self-control with our conversations, self-control in the things we post on social media, and that way we'll bring glory to God. And people will notice, like David, that we're people filled with self-control, which is so countercultural. it can only be from God. Let's pray. Father, we humbly acknowledge that we cannot do this by ourselves. Left to our own devices, we would just be like Abishai, wanting to strike Saul there and then and solve the problem. But thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in David's life that he could see 
your bigger plan, that he could stand back and say, no, Abishai, do not strike him. Let's take a different approach. And Father, we acknowledge that it's so easy for us just to adopt and take on the world's secular thinking. Think like every other person in the country. But Father, we know that you want us to be different. You want us to be salt and light. You want us to stand out as people who are full of the fruit of the Spirit, who are filled with self-control, and who are able to speak words of peace and wisdom and blessing because we think and we've made that choice to think scripturally and to speak words that honor you. May I decrease. May Jesus increase. And may the beauty of Jesus be seen in me and may others be attracted to know why I'm different. And may they ask, may I have the boldness and the courage to tell them about Jesus. We pray this for your glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand and sing, He Will Hold Me Fast. The words are so appropriate to what we've been thinking about this morning. Um.
with us this morning, whether you're here with us in the building or you're watching at home. We hope that you have heard God speak and we hope that you have been blessed by worshipping him with us. Our next in-person Sunday service will be next Sunday at 10.30 and we hope that you'll join us then at home or online or at, in the building or online. Um, we're going to change things up a little bit this morning. We're going to sing one last song as a lead-in to meeting around the Lord's table. The live stream will continue until we've sing, um, finished singing. So if you're online, please do stay with us until then. Um, but before that, let's pray together. Lord, you are a good God. And we thank you that we have heard you speak this morning. That you have challenged us and you have blessed us and you have reassured us. Father God, as we go into this week, we ask that you would really help us take stock of what we put into our minds, how we balance what we put into our minds. Lord, that you would help us to be self-controlled in what we say when we're with others and what we think when we're alone. For your glory and for your honour and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's sing His Mercy Is More. Let's really rejoice as we think about going into the time of uh, remembrance around this table. What love could remember no wrongs we have done on this 